Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The inspired writer penned these words to Christians. Wherefore, seeing that we are com compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Again, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. I do not know of a factor more vital to our salvation than an unwavering, lively, obedient faith. That faith is formed in us by the truth of God's word, Romans 10 and verse 17. And according to Paul, day by day we walk by that faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. That is, we are led by the truth of God. We walk as the word of God teaches us to walk. Now you'll notice that these first two verses of chapter 12 follow hard on the heels of chapter 11. Chapter 11 is certainly a record of great men who never knew the gospel, who never lived in the Christian age, but who were faithful to God in their time on earth according to God's directions for them. And inspiration picks them up and shows them as examples, patterns for us who have so much more knowledge of spirituality than they ever did for us to follow. And he speaks here of a besetting sin, a sin of unbelief. Now, the average person today who thinks of belief in God, belief in Christ, belief in the Bible, or belief as regards salvation, really never get any farther than mentally assenting to the fact in a given case. And that's what they mean by belief or faith. Well, I grant you we must mentally, in our minds that is, assent to the fact of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, and the Bible is the Word of God. All of that's essential. You'll never become a Christian and not do it. But that's not what's being talked about right here when he talks about the sin that does so easily beset us. He's talking about an obedient faith. Now those people who lived during the time that is covered by the Old Testament. In every case, every one of them mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith they did such and such. And since faith comes by hearing the word of God, by the word of God they acted. Every one of them exercised an obedient faith. It did not begin with them and end with them when it came to the meaning of faith that they just in their minds said God exists. While those people of Israel who were wandering the wilderness, they didn't say God does not exist. Well, why then were they destroyed in the wilderness? 20 years old and upward that left bondage in Egypt except for Joshua and Caleb, thousands of people died because of unbelief. Does that mean they all became atheists? It means they did not obey God. They engaged in practices contrary to God's will. 
And it's so sad that the majority of the people that claim Christ as Savior are involved in this besetting sin. They say, well, certainly God exists. Assuredly, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Indeed, the Bible is the very Word of God. And then in works they deny him. What kind of works? Works of obedience. Why I call you me Lord, Lord, Jesus asked. And do not the things which I say. It can't get clearer than that. Our problem with such verses is not our inability to understand them. If you were to explain that to somebody else, you would do it just like I would. Well, then where is the problem? We have been led to believe, it's the devil's blindfold. We've been led to believe that the belief that saves us is mentally assenting to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, I remind you that I mentally assent to the fact of history that there was a king in England known as Henry VIII. There was an Elizabeth I. But you know, in my mental assenting to the fact of those two monarchs who ruled England long years ago, I never loved one of them. And I never named them as my sovereign. And I never obeyed them and did not intend to obey them and am not going to obey them. But I believe him. The evidence is adequate and it's in. They were monarchs of England and I sent to the fact in the case. I don't know of a person that wouldn't. But it's terrible that there were people, and James addressed them in James chapter 2. They were members of the church who actually believed you could assent to the fact in the case as far as service to God, as far as believing in God, as far as being saved by God through Christ, and yet not obey the Lord. It's no wonder then you have in Hebrews 5, 9, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You can assent to the fact in the case that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God all you want to. And yes, that's the case, and you'd be right in doing so. But what did he say? Why call you me Lord, Lord? Why assent to the fact that I'm the Lord? But you don't do what I tell you. If you study the Old Testament scriptures, this was Israel's problem in our study in Isaiah. That's what Isaiah does in the very first chapter. God has him to indict Judah and Jerusalem for claiming one thing while all the time going against the will of God, rebelling against God, and doing as they please, but still wanting to claim God, that they were God's people. So the besetting sin of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is the sin of unbelief. But we have to get it out of our system what denominationalism has done to the thinking of a great many people who accept Christ to be the Son of God. That unbelief is always, in every case, denying the existence of God or the deity of Christ. Unbelief in most cases in the Old and New Testaments is disobedience to God. That's unbelief. And, but most people don't think that way. If you look at most of the writing of the New Testament, which is to Christians, 
then everything being said and all the details, some way or another, one extent or the other, says you must do as God tells you. And here is how you live as a Christian. Here is how you worship God. Here is how you conduct your life. Whoso continueth in the perfect law of liberty. This is the man that will be blessed in his deed. If you look at the perfect law of liberty, you understand it. You set at liberty from sin and the law of Moses. You're under law to Christ. You're saved. But it comes through obedience. If you think about it for a minute, from the sin of unbelief, every other kind of sin, transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, comes, is spawned. Every transgression and sin of omission of our duty, what we're obligated to do, lies in the sin of unbelief. These people James wrote to heard the same gospel anybody hears that's taught the scriptures to become Christians, and they obeyed it. He's not writing to people outside of Christ. And yet, look how he deals with these brethren. Because fundamentally, they were giving lip service. That is, their heart wasn't in it. They were simply saying, yes, this is the case. Yes, that's the case. But they weren't doing it. Now I want to show you how much that hits us right up to this present hour. Our Lord commissioned the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you're faithful to God according to your several abilities... You're going to be looking for every opportunity you can to teach people the truth. You'll even maybe make opportunities to do so. We acknowledge that's a responsibility that Christians have, that the church has. But how many of us are really interested in really putting it into practice and in trying to reach the world with the gospel? Every transgression and sin comes then from this besetting sin of unbelief. It stops obedience. It bars progress and growing in the knowledge and practice of the Lord. It'll promote cowardness among the brethren in the army of the Lord. It closes all kinds of doors, opportunities. It opens all kinds of floodgates of iniquity as far as the church is concerned. It pours water on the fires of enthusiasm and overthrows those who otherwise would triumph with God. Simply a belief that will not take God at his word and will not lead one to obey. Let's face it, when we look in the mirror, we are too often can see the besetting sin looking back at us. All too often, members of the church are always waiting for somebody else to do the work, always waiting for this, that, or the other. But then what does each member think their responsibility is? Unbelief led to the destruction of the world in Noah's day. The preaching of Noah did them no good, and thus the flood came in and destroyed them. Unbelief or disobedience laid the foundations for the building of the Tower of Babel. It caused Sarah to laugh when she was past age and she heard that she was to have a child. And it caused Lot's wife, once they had fled the wicked city of Sodom, to act contrary to the directions of God through the angel and look back. And she turned to a pillar of salt. Genesis chapters 11, 18 and 19. And we've already mentioned this, but remember, unbelief, and I'm saying again, when you see unbelief, it means they would not Obey God. Unbelief brought God's wrath on Israel. 
The psalmist said this, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. As I said before, they weren't standing up saying, Jehovah God does not exist. The law of Moses is not the word of God. Well, then what does this mean? They would not do God's will. For those who've been reading through Isaiah chapter 1, that's exactly what the prophet on God's behalf said to them. You simply won't do what you know is right. Something's more important to you than these things. And a greater man is Moses stopped from going into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. And God tells us why, Numbers 27 through 12. Listen, because ye believe me not to sanctify me before the children of Israel. Now that's disobedience. You know Moses didn't rise up and say, why, God doesn't exist. The law of Moses, well, that's just something I conjured up on Mount Sinai. It meant he wouldn't do what God said. The same sin of unbelief caused Israel to reject the true report of the spies sent into the land of Canaan. And because of that, they were made to wander for 40 years in the wilderness to, as I said earlier, the till the People who were 20 years old and upward saved Joshua and Caleb all died in the wilderness. And as they began to go in under Joshua, following the death of Moses to take the land of Canaan, we introduced Achan, and he died because of unbelief, because he would not do what God told them to do about the spoils that would come from the city of Jericho. Thus, they went up against the little city of Ai, and they got beat because sin was in the camp. And that brings this up. If you are a person who's guilty of the burden of besetting sin, you won't just impact yourself. You're going to impact your family. And you're going to impact the church. This ties in with what our Lord was teaching on the leavening for good that he intends the church to be in the world. Now, I want you to think for a moment. You're either leavening for good in the world or you're leavening for bad. It's up to me as to what I am. It's up to me to realize it's not enough to say Jesus Christ of Nazareth is a son of God, that he's the savior of the world, and then me turn around and not bring every thought, subjection to Christ in obedience to his will. People just don't realize in their own families when they don't do what God said do, they're training everybody in that family. You can acknowledge him as Lord but you don't have to obey him, and everything's going to be all right on the day of judgment. There's more than one way to lie to people. You don't have to just do it by saying God doesn't exist. You can do it by saying God does exist, but then being a practical atheist, what is that? Living like the atheist does. After recounting many of such events as we have from the Old Testament, the inspired apostle Paul warned us, now all these things happened unto them, children of Israel, for in samples. I've always liked the old King James, in samples. It's example in other versions. In sample is trying to say, these were done for the benefit of those who are God's children. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Why is that in your Bible? And by the way, it is in your Bible. And it says the same thing there it says here. These have such a bearing on our salvation. 
that he wrote this again. For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now that's a very important point, Romans 15, 4. When I read of all those obedient people listed by the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 11, who never knew the gospel that I know, who never were members of the Lord's church, never worshipped as the New Testament teaches them to worship, teaches us to worship. And do you see what he's saying? If they could be so determined to serve God in their day, what about you? When you have so much more delivered to you, why are you beset by such a sin? Listen to this in Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Again, I remind you, unbelief means an evil heart of disobedience. God's word also presented them these things. But the word preached did not profit them. That's the Israelites. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4 and verse 2. They heard it. They understood it intellectually. But no confidence and trust in God was produced in them. Not the confidence and trust that leads people to obey God. And we cannot lightly brush aside these danger signs. They're there always in the Bible to confront us at the last day. And so we have in Hebrews 4, 2, let us fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Obviously, Unbelief, this besetting sin, this disobedience is not confined to all of fleshly Israel in the Old Testament. Our Lord himself in walking this earth challenged unbelief. It's recorded of our Lord, he came into his own and his own received him not. But what about those who did receive him? But as many as did receive him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 11 through 12. I wish people would understand that passage just for what it says. It says simply, if you are brought to belief in Christ as a son of God, you have the power to become the son of God, not that by your belief alone without obedience did you become one. That's what the scripture says. But mental ascending to the fact in the case, being the view that most people have a belief, has caused many people not to obey the gospel. Christ entered his own country. Here's what's said. And he did not many mighty works there. Because of their unbelief, Matthew 13, 58. Now, if you go over to Mark's account, Mark adds this. And he marveled because of their unbelief, Mark 6 and 6. Now, I grant you this had to do with them receiving the evidence that he was the son of God. I said in the beginning that to mentally assent to the fact that Christ the Son of God is essential. You won't become a Christian without it. But it does not begin and end there. And in these two verses, it's saying people could see the evidence that he's the Son of God. But they rejected it and it completely marveled him that they could see this evidence and not believe. And it must have been refreshing for Jesus to hear the father of the dumb lad say with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief, Mark 9, 24. 
We ought to all be praying that all the time. We ought to be thankful for the belief we have, the obedience that it shows in our lives, but that's how you grow in greater faith. How often we today should confess this and our prayers constantly be pleading with our Father for a greater faith and then setting about to form it. Well, what crucified Jesus Christ? Unbelief. It's the underlying cause of the crucifixion of our Lord. In speaking of the fundamentals of the faith, Paul said of the Jewish leaders, which none of the princes of this world knew. Now listen to it. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 8. Why didn't they know it? Go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his confrontation with them. They would not receive the evidence. They rejected it. They didn't want it. And that bothers me greatly about a lot of folks, even some of my brethren. If you don't want something, you're not going to have it. No matter what, you have to tell yourself to deceive yourself. If it doesn't suit you, then it won't be. Peter said of them who were guilty, and now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did your rulers, Acts 3.17. Why, the Apostle Paul himself, when he was Saul of Tarsus, confessed later on that he persecuted the church out of ignorance. They were not considering the evidence. They were just saying they had their mind set on a certain thing, and that's all there is to it. There's no blinder person on this earth than one who will not see. Jesus had something to say about the blind leading the blind and that such all fall in the ditch together. At the time Jesus was killed, Paul held the same attitude, you'll remember, as I said a moment ago. Here's what he went ahead to say when he talked about to Timothy his persecution of the church. He said he was before blasphemer and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But when the evidence was in, Paul said, what must I do, Lord? No gainsay, just what must I do? People on the day of Pentecost, when the church began, devout people, religious people, Peter said, you've taken it with wicked hands of crucified and slain the Son of God. And what did they do? Well, they were pricked in their heart. They were guilty and they knew it. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers, he taught them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Well, that had to do with them becoming Christians. But to any of us today, if we get caught up in a sin, the only thing we can do is repent of the sin and turn from it. That's action on our part, having recognized the situation with our lives. The world is plagued by unbelief. All right now, it's sharp on our minds and through my lifetime, and has been several times, of what's going on over there in the Middle East. Now the Jews don't believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God. Neither do the Muslims. Neither one of them do. What would settle that whole matter over there? If he who long ago walked those same areas where the gospel was first preached, if they would fully believe that he is the Son of God and believe the gospel and obey it, they would all stop killing one another. And that's true of all things, because the unity that God wants in this world, Ephesians 4, John 17, comes through knowledge and practice of the truth of God.
but they're not about to do that. And we need to be praying that we be delivered from unreasonable men, for all men have not faith, as Paul said. And there's nothing worse that you can get yourself into is to try to reason with an unreasonable person. Some of us may have run into that a few times. Just try to reason with an unreasonable person and see what happens. I'll tell you what happens. It happened to the Lord. They'll nail you to a cross. And if the Lord warned people of the persecutors of the early church, and they'll think they're doing God's service. And, of course, when Saul was persecuting the church, that's exactly what he thought he was doing. Saul, Saul, Jesus said, and he appeared to him on the road to Damascus, Why persecutest thou me? You persecute my spiritual body, you persecute me. And notice the honest ignorance of this man. Who art thou, Lord? He tells him, I'm Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Well, that was the old goad they used to goad the ox to go down a road. Sometimes he'd kick back at it and hurt himself worse hitting that barb on there than he would if he had just moved on along. The obvious thing here is it's hard to go against God. It's hard to go against the evidence. And everybody that will not receive with meekness the engrafted word to believe and obey the truth is kicking against the pricks. It can't work out for good. It will only destroy you. Many refer to John 3.16 as the golden text of the Bible. Look at it with me, please. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's two verses later. Yet they'll look at John 3.16 and say, See, belief in Christ is all that's necessary. Never has been all that's necessary. Necessary? But all that's necessary? No. If you look at it, it plainly says that those who God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life, ought to have everlasting life. Doesn't mean that you will, but it means you're on the right road. You know, if I'm going to drive up this freeway out here, and go to Dallas, I have to begin, if I'm beginning from here, to go right up there and start. But when I get to Conroe, I'm a little closer. And so on all the way to finally when I get to Dallas. And thus, if I stop along the way and ask how far am I, I'm going to get a different answer. Because I'm closer in that case. And so when you read through people becoming Christians after the church is established, Acts 2, the gospel's gone out. You'll find people told to believe. You'll find people told to believe and be baptized. You'll find some believers who were told to repent without belief being mentioned. Why? Because they'd already done those things. When you see Saul of Tarsus and Saul's, uh, or Luke's account of Saul's conversion in Acts 22, the gospel preacher selected by Jesus and sent to Saul came there and realized his condition. What was Saul's condition? He was a believer and penitent. So what did a man say to him? And now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. That was never said to an unbeliever. But it was said to one who had believed in Christ. He was not qualified. Since you're qualified, what are you waiting on? That's what he said. The way we'd say it nowadays. Unbelief guarantees only condemnation. And unbelief not only means I don't accept the facts that Christ is the Son of God, but it means I'm not doing what he says, but I claim him anyway. Jesus warned, for if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins, John 8, 24. Not I many have heard this. A whole lot of people don't believe it. If they did, they would believe and obey the gospel. They hear, they hear Christ saying, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. Or they read Acts 17 and 30, repent, and uh, God has uh, winked at this ignorance, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Well, they know it's a command. Commands are to be obeyed, but they don't. 
God's commanded all men everywhere to repent, and all men everywhere must repent, Acts 17, 30, and 31. And so we come down to the person who has believed and who has repented of sins. Are they acceptable to God? No. Because Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so you look throughout all around us, and we see people, as I started out with, who think that this belief is just merely ascending to something. Then I close further with my brethren, because unbelief has shackled the church in many cases. Give you an example. Give, and it shall be given you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom, Luke 6, 38. We don't understand that Christianity is a giving religion. We just don't. And we read this and acknowledge that he's saying, give yourself to him. He that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. We read all these passages. We go on and work it out some way where we don't have to do it. Now, I let that be just one thing that stands for all of our service as Christians in the family of God. If God gave as we give, would he have ever given his son to die for us? And yet we're the beneficiaries of the greatest sacrifice ever made. We're the beneficiaries of the wonderful love of God that even our minds can't grasp. So what are we giving? Are we giving our lives? We ought to. If you're not a child of God this morning, we study what to do to become one. If as a child of God, you've been operating more on ascending to the fact of things about the Bible than doing them, then we urge you to repent of whatever they may be that are wrong. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. We hope we will not be guilty of this besetting sin of unbelief and disobedience. But if you are, we invite you to come to Christ while we stand and while we sing.